Again, repeating, uh, 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 Johnson & Johnson doesn't do this, but one of your competitors tells their detail men and their salesmen that you have to. You have to repeat it seven times to the, to the doctor before they understand it. Well, I think, I think they're really exaggerating. I think it's only four or five if we listen, but sometimes we don't listen. You know? so, so what happens with all of this? What happens is that desiccating stress does this, but it does something else too. It upregulates both the lacrimal gland and the, um, and the meibomian glands. So when you were in Boston, if you remember, Mark Abelson, who was one of the world's best ophthalmologists, particularly in the field of allergies, would say, it's a terrible thing that we allow the lacrimal gland to be inflamed. When we biopsy it, it's inflamed. It's a terrible thing. That's the cause of dry eye, the inflammation of the lacrimal gland. Well, he's partly right, because your lacrimal gland secretion goes down when it's inflamed. But how do we correct inflammation of the lacrimal gland, and why is it inflamed? Because if we have desiccating stress, did anybody when we were steering have any tearing? I guess not. But if it went on just a second more, the next defense, the alarm system sets off as tearing. So you have low-grade tearing going on when you're steering. And that low-grade tearing upregulates both the lacrimal glands and the meibomian glands. So they're working all the time. So all of a sudden, they're not made to work all the time like that. So we're raising them, and we're basically making them run a marathon at high speed. And what happens? As Jester's lab found out with the mice, when you do that and you have desiccating stress, you get atrophy. Before you get atrophy, you get inflammation. So inflammation is one of the processes that causes uh, that, uh, that atrophy. And desiccating stress may result from any activity, again, that in decreases the frequency and efficacy of the blink. And this is a device that, uh, that can be purchased from Johnson & Johnson. And it came out before Lipiscan, and it's a device uh, that allows us to measure lipid layer thickness, which gives us a pretty good idea whether the glands are functional. Not as good, in my opinion, as looking at their function directly, but it doesn't take any skill and it doesn't take any time, and it also measures partial blinking, and that's very important because if the patient is a chronic partial blinker, again, it kicks off the entire cycle of desiccating stress. And there's a gentleman, an ophthalmologist in Boston named Pedram Hamra, and those of you who are pathologists will, will immediately recognize that that's normal, and that's what happens in MGD. Um, and for the corneal nerves, the corneal nerves with, uh, with desiccating stress in MGD get, uh, get all beaten up. Uh, and then what do we have? We have all these cells which, which, which are there ready to eat up all of the tissue. And the same thing happens for the area around the meibomian glands, the normal, and then you can see all of this inflammation, all of the white, white, white material, which is just simply infiltrative material, uh, which, is, uh, which accumulates. So, okay, so that's what it is. Well, how do we treat it? If it's that bad, how do we treat it? Hmm? Good, good question. Well, if the obstruction is a problem, we should certainly remove the obstruction. But we don't have an obstruction remover at the present time unfortunately. Like you can get the wine cork out, you can buy a very complicated device which will pull the wine cork out beautifully. But we don't have that for the meibomian gland, so we don't have a method to do that. Although before I will, uh, before I forget, I would like to say that debriding the lid margin with a golf ball spud is very, very helpful. And with practice, any of you can, can do that under a microscope uh, and uh, it's, it probably takes between 60 and 120 seconds for both eyes. Um, uh, no more, certainly for the just the lower lids, and you can also do the upper lids. Uh, but what we want to do is we really, we number one, want to remove the obstruction, but it would be even better if we could prevent the obstruction. So do we wait until our children have cavities and periodontal disease, or do we prevent it by having them brush and floss and taking care of them out. Everyone knows the answer. So now we're going back to the same 
question that we asked at the beginning. This is so complicated. This is the one where I use the analogy of, 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 of Pavlov. And so what we're asking is, of all these scores of treatments that we have, which is best? Okay? And you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised because we're learning more and more that it's not the antibiotics. We're learning more and more that it's not the medications. We're learning more and more that it's a combination of other problems that we have to deal with. Um, and uh, we're learning that punctal plugs do not address this problem. Yes, they help a limited number of people, but they don't address the basic problem. What, and what we have learned uh, is that, um, for instance, lid hygiene is critical. We've learned that moisture chambers, creating 100% humidity in front of the eye, would be very bad for drying your clothes. There'd be nothing worse. No wind and high humidity. But that's the best when people have neuropathic pain or corneal hyperalgesia or when we get their meibomian glands better but they still have symptoms. So let me quickly go over warm compressors with you. Warm compressors seem simple. simple. Everybody says, well, I'm going to buy a device in the, in the supermarket or in the drugstore and do it and put it in a microwave and it only is about 30% effective, or it may not even be that. Uh, the best one is a Bruder, B-I-U-D-E-R, mask in the United States. That's probably 60 to 70% effective because it's not wet heat. But if you take and you heat it up and you put a heated microfiber-thin water barrier between the warm compress and the eye, it will be much, much better. And why will it be much better? It will be much better because... If you want to transmit heat or energy or electricity, you need, as the engineers know, you need a wet medium. It doesn't go through a dry medium. And for those of you who still don't understand, think of your basement changing a light bulb. If you had a light bulb to change, would you change it with your bare feet in water? Bad idea in the bathroom. Very bad idea because you could become electrocuted even from, from 110. Why? Because water is such a great conductor. So you're trying to get the heat through and you need a great conductor and that is water. And what happens is heating the outer lid is very quick. And for cases with blepharitis, if you can heat the, upper, the outer lid up to about 42C, You'll, you'll help it immensely. You'll loosen the stuff and you'll make it very easy for, the lit, for the, all this dead material to be, to be removed. Um, and you could do that by just having a wet compress at about 45 degrees, which is 113 Fahrenheit, which is warm but still tolerable and still comfortable. And that works well in two minutes. But if you want to heat the area of the meibomian glands, the meibomian glands anatomically being in the rear, you have to have much, much, much longer. So it takes you somewhere between five and six min minutes to heat it up to about 40 degrees uh, C. If you can keep a 45 degree uh, a temperature on the outside of the lid, because going through the lid, you lose that, that, uh, uh, that type of, 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 of heat. Uh, and we published all that in 2008. Uh, in a in a uh, in a paper. Now, physical expression. Physical expression is not new. In 1880, a wonderful Italian ophthalmologist figured out a lot of this, and he figured out that the way you improve the meibomian glands was to take was to visit the woodmaker's office, the person who made the cabinets for the house, and get one of their clamps, and he put it without anesthesia right on the lids, and he just kept turning the screw. And that's how he expressed glands. And it was pretty painful. We reduplicated his clamp, actually. We made one, and we put it on people's lids, and they were not happy. So we don't recommend that you read that paper and implement his method. But what we found, originally in 1980, we used a Q-tip, and we now use one of these spatulas. They're available. Uh, they're, they're just much cleaner and much easier. And what we know is that is that at about 10, uh, the amount of pressure when it's about 10 PSI, 10 pounds of pressure per square inch, as measured by this particular instrument, we know that that's about the limit of what most people can endure. And we know that topical anesthesia helps about 25%, but it doesn't solve all the problem. You're almost 
just as well off to do it without an anesthetic and work with the patient and, and monitor the amount so, so they won't have a lot of pain. Uh, I've never had a complication from it, and I've really expressed probably 10,000 or more lids. Uh, but if you really want to express it, you have to go up to maybe 15 or 30 PSI, and that pain is really intolerable. Because what we're doing is we're taking and we're trying to express that plug out. The plug is attached to the wall by what I call this filamentary network. So it's attached right into the wall, and we're trying to push it out by physical expression. And we can do it. And the less, it, the, um, the less severe it is, the easier uh, it is to, is, is to push it out. Um, so, so that's what we do. So that's one way of doing it, and I would encourage it. That's, th that's a reasonable way. I did it for 10 years. And then another way is with drops, and we had questions about what kind of drops and what kind of drops were. Well, lipid drops work best if they have phospholipids in them, and that's where I spent about 10 years of my life. So uh, these are the products in the United States which are available with, uh, with lipids. The Sustain products, uh, uh, Balance, which has been out for about six years, and now they're coming out with a similar one which isn't, which isn't milky and has a, a nanoparticle of these materials, but it's still a phospholipid, uh, and that's good. Bosch & Lohm has Soothe, which does not have phospholipids. I developed that as a alternative to the phospholipids. And then Ocusoft um, is one, and Refresh, Retain is one, uh, and Refresh Optive. So those are the five lipid drops that are currently available in the United States. And you know, do they work? Yes, they're very useful. They really are very, very useful. Uh, do they cure anything? No. Uh, they're a palliative method of treatment. Now, could they be a prophylactic method of treatment? Probably, if we just put drops on people that lubricate, that stop desiccating stress, because these do help in stopping de desiccating stress. So if we do that, yes, they, 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 they will be helpful. They will be helpful. And uh, I use them myself, my family uses them, and we prescribe them. But they're not the ultimate cure, okay? It, it's a method that, that will help the person uh, and it is important to bring them help now. So there's a device called Lipaflow. And Lipaflow is that device which was designed to, to eliminate the plug. So instead of physically expressing them with all this pressure, uh, we wanted to, uh, wanted to be able to treat it better and treat it without pain. So we had two dual breakthroughs. And this goes back, and I did mention this when we were here last time. We want to apply heat not to the outer surface, but to the inner surface. And if anyone ever told me 20 years ago that we could ever apply heat to the inner surface, I would have said, you're crazy. But it turns out we can. And, uh, and as long as the heat doesn't go above about 43.5, uh, we can do it. Now, Lipaflow, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, Lipaflow in the United States was the original method of doing this. They're now bringing out many other techniques and attempting to do that. And whether they'll be successful remains to be seen, particularly in view of the patent situation. Um, and in addition to applying the heat, uh, which we want to, to, to go through and get the meibomian glands, and we apply the heat by having a device which sits on the cornea, which is insulated from the cornea, where the interior surface of that device contacts the palpebral conjunctiva and applies heat. So it's just like taking a branding iron that you brand cattle with. But instead of being on the outside, we're applying it on the inside. And while we're doing that, we're applying pulsating pressure. So we're combining the heat and the pressure in a very regulated, safe, method uh, for 12 minutes. And that only melts out the plug at the end, but more importantly, I think, and we haven't discussed this with you, but we will, is I think it, I think it debrides the acini. So if we went ahead and we said, can you treat corneas that have severe problems without debriding them? You'll tell me, yeah, you can treat some without debriding them, but a lot have to be debrided because you've got to get off all the old material before new cells will grow over. 
So I think what's happening uh, to a great degree is the fact that, that, uh, uh, that when we apply heat and pulsating pressure for 12 minutes, it's long enough to actually clean out many of the acini. Okay, now th this is a slide which just shows much of the same. And, um, and that's the cup that, that it, this is like a scholar lens. And the, this is the surface here, the front, that would rest against, that rests against the, uh, the back of the lid. So this surface which goes in, that's the shaft on a scholar lens. That's the heat, that's the insulation. And that heats the meibomian glands. And uh, it insulates the cornea, and it's done for 12 minutes. And I think what it does is it sort of cleans out a lot of this material. So if the gland is blocked and, and the system shuts down because maybe there's a pressure within the middle of it, I think, Tony, that I think all, a lot of stuff, as we discussed, accumulates here. And I think that if you apply enough heat long enough, you'll liquefy a lot of that. And if you keep expressing it and you've opened up the plug enough for this to escape, you're, you're offering that surface an opportunity to grow new epithelium much better. And whenever we see dilated glands by that instrument or by any other mybographer at the end, that is not normal. That is not normal. Because the slides that we showed that Dr. Henriquez made, they were under 200 magnification. So, so, so he would see the dilation. But with this method, you shouldn't. It, 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 there should be no dilation like that. And that's dilation because I believe that's been caused by, 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 by the plug. Um, so I won't go into all this, but uh, Lipaflow has a patent in, in randomized, uh, 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 very carefully controlled studies. Uh, uh, prospective, randomized, uh, blind, the very, very controlled studies of, of, of improving gland f function between two and three times, decreasing symptoms right across in all these studies, about 50%. And there were key points in the first FDA a study. It took about one month after Lipaflow for people to really begin to feel better. We now understand that better. Um, and we, we learned in a duration study that, um, that, that one treatment would last 12 months to some degree. So it didn't, it didn't disappear tomorrow. Yet, if the person's on the computer all day and you treat them, and they don't do anything to correct their blinking, and they don't do any homework, then you're going to get a much faster regression than if they do do homework. And it was done with cataract surgery, and it was done with contact lens wearers. And with contact lens wearers, there was almost a four-hour increase in comfortable wear from 5.4 hours to 9.1 hours. So uh, the, the, the paper... Uh, that Dr. Now led was she did a very careful study, prospective F IRB, the entire thing, um, of the entering students at the College of Optometry. And we're also doing one at a medical school. So we want to catch the freshmen coming in and see how they look when they come in and how they look when they leave. How much does that additional four years of intensive study and work uh, cause further problems? And we did a uh, the questionnaire for their symptoms. The questionnaire for their symptoms. Seventy percent of the entering class, and we there was a hundred in the class, and we caught eighty-one. We studied eighty-one. Uh, Seventy percent of them were symptomatic. Forty-one percent of this class needed daily drops. Forty-one percent of people between the age of twenty-one and twenty-five. Uh, my biography. 17% had over 50% of their glands with 20% or more atrophy. That is terrifying because many of these, if it continues, will never finish their career. Computer use, 17% now have a problem using a computer. Difficulty wearing contact lenses, 40%. So if the contact lens industry loses 40% of their patients, it will be good because there'll be less waste. There'll be less disposable lenses used. The world will be better. So this is good data. But the contact lens companies don't think so, and the population doesn't think so. 
So difficulty wearing lenses and lipid layer thickness should be about a minimum of 70. 100 would be great, and it's about 50. So they do not present a great, a great profile. Okay, what's the natural evolution of meibomian glands? Well, the normal aging process are in effect, and there's no question that age has a problem where our blink isn't as good, there isn't as much pressure brought against the meibomian glands, and they, they, they have the problem. Uh, so prevention versus aging. The dental model. For many years, people would say, you can't prevent the loss of teeth. We'll just pull them early, put in all new teeth, uh, uh, not implants, but just put in the artificial teeth on the top, the artificial teeth on the bottom. You'll learn to use them. Everything will be good. So, so, but we learned that you can keep your teeth, and we'll learn that you can keep your meibomian glands. And we, we, we understand that diet and smoking are not good for anything. But where with the teeth, you can close them out. With the eyes, if you close the eyes, you can't see. So that's not so good. So, so we have to remember the wind and the sun. We have to remember the laundry story. We have to remember the vocation and the near work. When people are on a computer eight or ten hours a day, you have to tell them you've got to do homework. You have to be treated. You have to be treated with lipoflow. You have to be treated with expression. You have to be able to be treated with whatever you have. We, again, we have to understand that handheld devices are probably even worse because, again, they're anticipatory. They prevent people from doing this. And we have to remember the obvious impact of blinking. So all of this is developing, but we have enough knowledge now to understand that we should at least start, you know? And I think President Kennedy, I don't remember it exactly, but he was famous for saying in the United States, we have a lot of problems, it's very complicated, all the areas we have to, but we have to start. And I would appeal to everybody to recognize that now is the time when we have enough to start. Here we have the dental model. The goal is to stop teeth decay and gum disease. And what do they do? They have a dental hygienist. They have routine exams. They have prophylactic treatment for the young of old. They scale our teeth. Routine prophylactic gum treatment, routine x-rays, daily home brushing and flossing. So they have a whole program. And what do we have? Nothing. Nothing. If you went to the dentist and they had nothing today to prevent you from getting these problems, you'd find a new dentist. But everybody in this room, including myself, is guilty because that's not our culture. We treat reactively. We, we treat at the end. We treat when it's too late. We're the dentist who says, we can't, we can't treat you, we'll just pull your teeth. Not a good idea. So the eye model should be to prevent meibomian gland dysfunction, obstruction, and desiccating stress. The eye model should be annual or biannual exams where we measure their function and structure and monitor it. Now, can we all do that? Do we have the time to do it? Can the hospitals do it? Can the government do it? No, no. but it has to start. It really has to start. Um, and we have to teach people to blink. We have to understand lipid layer thick, uh, thickness. We have to debride people. We have to have a method of every time they come in, they should get the same questionnaire. And we've been using the same questionnaire for about seven years without any change at all because it works. And we can look at it sequentially, and we can tell whether people are going up or whether they're going down, and it's extremely valuable. And what we need in our field is we need to understand this, and then we need people in our office who are ocular hygienists to, to, to carry this out. Okay, well, not everybody is successful. Why aren't they successful? Well, people will say, well, not everybody can be successful. Okay, but why? There's always the why. We always should ask the question why seven times before we give up on seven different days at seven-month intervals. So the first step in my mind is partial and infrequent blinking. And if you just take people who are starting to have dry eyes and they just learn to blink properly, uh, it would be remarkable. I just taught one of the, uh, the video men back here, who said that I caused his dry eyes because he was here two years ago when I presented. And he could feel the contagious going through the air from what I was saying. And three months later, he was struck with dry eyes. So he came up to me and explained that today. And I looked at his blink, and you could see he's a partial blinker. So I explained to them that what you have to do is you have to blink. But 
Blinking isn't easy because it's not at a conscious level. So the way I teach individuals to blink is I explain to them that we have to teach them, number one, to shut down. And number two, we have to teach them to use the right muscles so they don't have to think about it. We want to change the muscles. So I teach them, we close our eyes one, we close our eyes just normally. You shut your eyes. And then you hold them for a count of one or two, for two. So we close our eyes and we pause one, two, because we want the lids to get used to kissing. So if we can all can remember our first kiss, we don't go in hard. We go in very slowly and we just touch very, very, very lightly. And we try to get used to that feeling because it's a new feeling. So if we're a partial blinker, it's exactly the same story. So what we want to do is we want to come down, close, pause, one, two, pause, one, two. And then at, after the pause, we squeeze lightly one, we squeeze a little harder two, and we squeeze a little harder three. And we don't use these muscles over here. So everyone try it. Close, close, pause, one, two at the bottom. Squeeze lightly one, squeeze lightly two, squeeze lightly three, and you're done. Now, you were good at the beginning, but then you squeeze too hard. You're using all your muscles. We don't want you to use. We just want you to use this muscle here, the ubiquilaris. So if you feel your face muscles way down here moving, on the first two blinks, it's too much. So if you have a tape of this, it's close, pause one, two, squeeze a little bit, squeeze a little bit more, and then the last one you can squeeze any way you want. And if they do that once an hour, it's amazing how much better people get. It's amazing how much people get. Will that remove the plug? No, absolutely no. That will not remove the plug. But what it does is it will prevent, it will, it will remove minor debris within there over a period of time, but it will prevent more from accumulating. And if you use that with warm compressors, sometimes really the results uh, can be can be quite remarkable. Uh, then there's a product called Lid Seal, which we will get in. We call it the core blacky light test. There's glass, there's dropout, there's lid margin health. And let me just, in the interest of time, go through this. So Lid Seal. Lid Seal is that condition where at night, when you're sleeping, the lids appear shut, but they let air in. So very frequently, when we ask people, They'll say, in the morning when I wake up, my eyes bother me. Well, in the morning when they wake up, their eyes should be the best because they've been covered all night. So that means they're being exposed to air. And that means that light, that air is coming in between the two lids, even though they're shut. And the reason is that the top lid doesn't meet like that, but the top lid slides over the bottom lid. And if that seal isn't tight, air will get in. And the less tight it is, the more air will get in and the more the problems. So you take a, a, a Finhoff transilluminator, you put it right above, and you move it around a little bit, and the angle is usually about, about a 45 degree angle like that. With the lid you just tell the patient, close your eyes just like you're going, falling asleep, nice and slow. And you just place it like that, and then you just move it around a little bit to be sure you're in the right place. And you want to be right at the top of the tarsus. And when you do that, the light goes right around the tarsus and bingo. If, if uh, uh, here, when, when, here when we do that, it, it's hard to see, it's really hard to understand this, but there's the, upper, uh, there's the upper lid and there's the top of the tarsus. And here you can see the light coming out Right, right between them. The minute you have that, that patient most likely is going to have symptoms when they wake up in the morning. But more importantly, their corneas are becoming inflamed, they're getting desiccating stress. So treating them during the day is more difficult because you are raising the level of inflammation. And when you raise the level of inflammation, the higher you raise it, then the more difficult, uh, the more the stress on the nerves and the more difficult it is to treat these people. So this is a test that anybody can do. It's very, very simple. Uh, if you look up on the, 
my name or your Google Core Blackie light test, there was an article that was published uh, in 2015 on that. And there's the Fran Hoff Illuminator, and that's how it's that's how it's put in. Uh, and that's how we come down with it, and there's the light coming out, and there's a little bit of light coming out, and a lot of light coming out. Um, another one uh, is gland dropout, and we've already studied that. So it depends upon the magnitude. So if you don't have confidence in understanding atrophy and a method to look at atrophy, such as you could do with an instrument, or if you're very good and you learn how to use transillumination, that would be adequate. Not optimal, but adequate. Certainly better than nothing. Then when you treat these people, you know prospectively how to treat them, because you tell them you're never going to be better because you have lost all these glands. But we want to stop you from getting worse, and we want to provide you with relief. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention that the treatment for uh, for lid seal would be what? The first line of treatment is an ointment. Uh, because an ointment pr protects the cornea and it stops the air from getting there and, and hopefully it eliminates desiccating stress. If that doesn't do it, then the next step is moisture goggles on top of the ointment. So then you use both. Uh, but I always try ointment first. Uh, and here, again, his corneal hyperalgesia, because what's happened, it's got to a stage where you can see with confocal microscopy that these nerves have been altered. So when the nerves, not everybody has access to a confocal microscope, obviously, but you can assume that a high percentage of your patients have this. And if you have the time and you want to test for it, the way you test for it is to put on a pair of swim goggles to create 100% humidity. You leave them on for 20 to 30 minutes. You ask the patient, how do you feel? A, B, C, D, F. F, terrible, terrible. Uh, I can't work. I'm disabled. A, perfect. B, good. C, you know, it's tolerable, but it hurts. I'm not happy. And D, it's not good at all. So you get that rating before you put them in the goggle, then you put them in the goggle. If the goggle doesn't create any improvement in what they report as comfort, then you know you have some form of hyperalgesia. Something is going on that isn't going to be easily solved. So that, again, explains to the patient that they have to do a lot more work and they have to be treated a lot more. In addition to that, in addition to that, when we, when, we, when we treat these people, when we look at these, uh, at, 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 at these individuals, and we do this goggle test, what we want to know with the goggle test is if they go from a D to an A in 20 minutes, we can guarantee that they'll be at least 75% better in six months. If they blink, if they use warm compressors, and if we get the plug out because they do not have neurosensory difficulties. But once you allow them to get to these stages, we have big problems. Uh, uh, I gave uh, a lecture in Paris in December in 2017, and these were the questions. Uh, I'm going to shift a little bit now to contact lenses. So I was giving a lecture on, uh, requested, they requested a lecture on contact lens uh, discomfort, and this was this advanced uh, AOP, the Advanced Ophthalmological Practice in Paris, France, the past uh, December. And uh, the questions that, that this gentleman, Musilier, who is very, very, very bright, asked, uh, contact lens discomfort, what is the role of the meibomian glands? Are the preventative treatments and modalities to improve wearing? Does wear affect the meibomian glands? What's the time scale? Does contact lens material affect contact lens wear in meibomian glands? We were talking about that, I guess, with various people at the college today. And can my, can my biography predict contact lens success? So those are the questions that he asked. Well, here's the way I look at it, and I've been using this for maybe 10 years. We want contact lens comfort. And there's all of these factors that are involved, OK? There's the lens edges, there's GPC, there's oxygen, there's immunology, there's tear film, there's blinking, there's meibomian glands, there's friction and lubosity. There's the lid wiper, very important, the inside of the upper lid. 
which, which acts as the sentinel. It acts as the alarm system for anything getting on the eye. The reason it's so sensitive is because we have a foreign body. We have anything. When we blink, we feel it. Where do we feel it? We feel it on the lid wiper. And excessive evaporation, evaporative stress, and hyperalgesia. So what, what have we done? The blue tells us the areas that we've solved. So we've solved the problem of edges, materials. We've solved GPC. We've solved oxygen. Immunology, you know, we've learned a lot about it. We certainly know how to treat it reasonably well or how not to treat it. But the tear film, we're not done with that. Blinking, we're not done with that. The meibomian glands are responsible for all of this. Friction and lubricity, lid wiper, excessive evaporation, evaporative stress, and hyperalgesia. So those are the areas that we haven't solved. So all contact lenses increase evaporation with the exception of therapeutic scleral lenses. So the minute you put a contact lens in the eye, you're increasing evaporation. You're increasing desiccating stress. Now, if the tear film is good enough to withstand all that and protect it, everything is fine. But if it isn't, then you will have problems. And tear evaporation increases during contact lens where evaporation rates are not attributable to most lens materials. And the wearing of any lens does disrupt the tear film to increase uh, evaporation. And this work, a lot of this work started as early as 1982 with Tomlinson and staff, and also in Boston, uh, Miguel Rafojo and Maurizio Orlando, who is now a practicing ophthalmologist in Italy. But this is all, okay, it's, it's here. Um, but that's all about evaporative stress. And that brings us back to the fact that we discovered this in 1980 that's why these contact lenses, which were wonderful new lenses, CSI, which people could wear, most of people, half of people or more could actually wear them, put them on and just wear them indefinitely. Wear them a month at a time, they were perfect. But other people could not. And we, the reason that they could not had to do with MGD. So evaporative stress initiates the dry eye cascade, and we sort of went through this. But the result of all of this ends up in inflammation. And when you have inflammation, you end up losing meibomian glands. And uh, in lipoflow with contact lenses, we were 112 contact lens wearers were studied at five different sites, and there was almost a four-hour increase in comfortable wear from 5.4 to 9 hours. Remarkable, but that's treating the meibomian glands once with lipoflow, once. But imagine if you got a patient to do warm compresses and blinking, you'd avoid all this. You'd just avoid it. They'd be wearing contact lenses. And MGD are the preventive treatments. Well, prevalent, chronic, and progressive. So MGD is prevalent, it's chronic, and it's progressive. It leads to all of that. And what is extremely interesting is that rigid, with, with rigid gas permeable lenses, um, you could, the people who wore them successfully for 30 or more years had eight glands or more working on the lower lid. Eight glands. But with soft contact lenses, they had less, six glands. And that was versus the control of 3.5. So the regular population who didn't wear them only had three glands and they had marginal dry eye symptoms as a lot of people in their 50s and 60s do. But the people who could wear these contact lenses had many more glands open. So did the contact lenses make it better? No. Does lens wear affect the meibomian glands? Well, here we have the same thing. But multiple studies, starting with Ong many years ago, have found the contact lens wear is associated with adverse changes in the meibomian glands. So people wearing contact lenses are putting their meibomian glands at risk. And the first paper was in 1990 by, uh, by Ong and Locke in Wales and England. He was a great scientist. And then more recently by Arita, who was a very well-known Japanese ophthalmologist uh, in 2009. So we do know the contact lenses negatively affect the meibomian glands. And what's the mechanism of action? Again, same thing. Uh, evaporated stress, desiccating stress, same thing, and blink inhibition. Does the lens material affect contact lens wear in meibomian glands? Well. Even a utopian contact lens must increase evaporation due to its physical presence and movement of the lids outwards. So we push the lid outwards 
a little bit. We can't help that when we put something on. But the less the evaporation, the more the comfort. And when you take these soft contact lens wearers and you put the goggle on them, even if they're not comfortable, 95% of them become immediately comfortable. So it's all evaporation. It's just all evaporation. And we never recognized this, you know. Maurizio Orlando had a laboratory in my office when he was a fellow in Boston. And we had people, he had people wearing divers helmets, measuring all of this evaporation. Great work. But there's a, a, a saying, unfortunately, in France. You hate to give the French credit for great things. But they had a great saying. And the saying was, a philosopher there said, it is very difficult to understand the importance of a new idea. Very difficult. And it's difficult even for the people who discover the new idea. So imagine how difficult it is for the people who didn't discover the new idea, unless they're contrary thinkers. So when these new ideas come, we should be much more careful in, in at least exploring them. And the, so the less the evaporation, and, uh, uh, and then the contact lens surface can never mimic the cornea. You don't have plica on it. You don't have a system to collect mucus. The cells don't regenerate. Um, it's just a different system, and it will never be that way. It can never be. Uh, it can never be what the cornea is, uh, from what I would think. Uh, and as such, we will always have this. But the meibomian glands will always be there. We know we can improve them. We know we can dramatically improve them. We know we can double and triple their capacity. So if we do that, we have a much better answer for all the contact lens wear than we have by just changing the material a little bit. Although, we should certainly change the material. And the new materials are fantastically better. They are just fantastically better, particularly the one-day lenses, because they put millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars in the research in how to make that surface uh, more compatible with the, with the tear film. OK, so the summary uh, of contact lenses is we really have to understand that we have to treat the tear film. We have to use the best material. And the other factors of blinking immunology and a host of others. But we should treat them early. The minute they have any problem with symptoms at all, they should just be treated. Going the wrong way. All right, there's a little breaking news that I'll go over very quickly. Um, and it's recent. And it, uh, I mentioned it earlier, but I'll just mention it again. Because it, with this in mind, it just completely changed the thinking of so many. Uh, the first is this dream study that was done. This was a very good study. No study is perfect. Every study should have another 20 arms. So if you're testing a dose, you should test 10 different doses. You should test it in concert with, with other things. So before you know, you have a matrix of 100, and it would take 100 years to do the study. But this study was really a good study. And what it basically found was unbelievable. Omega-3s, omega-3s failed to have any beneficial effect beyond that of a placebo on dry eye. Absolutely unbelievable. And the person who ran the study, an ophthalmologist, Penny Asbell, said, I was the greatest advocate because I was sure it worked. And I now know it doesn't. I was wrong. Okay. And again, that's the story that you cannot repeat 90% of all studies that are done. And that's why I do study after study, pilot studies, until I'm convinced that I can repeat it. And there's never a protocol that's ever written for any study by anybody, including Johnson & Johnson, including Alcon, including the best companies in the world. There's never a protocol that's written that's a final protocol until two consecutive studies prove that you can't alter that protocol. And that's impossible at a, at a practical level. So that there was very, 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 very discouraging. And where was it published? In the number one medical journal in the world, the New England Journal of Medicine. The number one medical journal. And everybody in research knows how difficult it is to get an article, uh, particularly on eyes, in the New England Journal of Medicine. Just staggering. And the second, uh, 
Okay, and I won't bother with, with the study. Um, there's another piece of breaking news, and let's call that up the nose. And that's a, a strange thing. So uh, uh, Otto Sherman in the year 1902 was interested in knowing whether the lacrimal gland was really dead or not dead. So what did he do? He took material and shoved it up the nose and rotated it, and if the patient didn't tear, he said, the lacrimal gland is finished. It doesn't work. If the patient does tear, the lacrimal gland is okay. So we know for a long time that putting, in a, putting an object and traumatizing the upper part of the nose causes treatment. So Al again has seized upon this. Oh, there's Shermer right there, 1903. And uh, he recommend. Uh, so Shermer in 1903 was the first to do this, and Al again has purchased a company that was started by Stanford students where they pulse electrical energy uh, to nerves in the nose. It sends a stimulus to the brain, and the stimulus is the tear, and it works. So if I do that <coughs> into both of my nostrils, as they recommend, uh, nine out of 10 people tear. And sometimes that tearing lasts for hours, sometimes it lasts for minutes, sometimes it may last for four hours. And that's now being introduced in the United States, and I'm sure it will be introduced in Spain. Uh, but we don't know what the long-term effect is of this up-the-nose treatment. Uh, and uh, uh, we may make the lacrimal gland work so hard that it has other problems. But nobody, un nobody knows. They, they were approved at the end of a three-month study. So the long-term effects are not known. Uh, what we do know, uh, what I know, is that if you just take a cotton applicator and you gently put that up the nose and you rotate it, it will do the same thing. And I have given that to probably 40 patients. And I'd like to tell you that the results are spectacular. Uh, with many people, it's better than nothing. And they do it whenever their eyes are dry. So they're sitting in a computer, and they put their head down so nobody will see what they're doing. And they go up the nose with the cotton applicator, one up each eye, and they rotate it. And, and they feel better for a while. So that's good, because it's hard to make people feel better now particularly if they have neuropathic pain. So all, all that is good. But I don't know where that will end. And then the other staggering piece of information is by Leisha Schwartz, an MD. And at Dartmouth College and Dartmouth Medical School, they have a, a, an, an institute for the public good. And they analyze articles and they attempt to find out what's happening. And uh, she published in the American Medical, in the journal of the AMA, JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. If you look it up, that's the third best medical journal in the world. Uh, uh, um, and she looked at the subject that restasis, does restasis work? And she said there's virtually no evidence of efficacy and why does restasis have $2 billion a year in annual sales? Because they spend $645 million a year in advertising. And they've convinced everybody that mistasis does work. So that leads us to the question that I've asked all along, who can the doctor trust? And that's the Amgen study. 100 scientists found that 47 of the 53 studies could not be replicated. And that was published in Nature. So all of this was not published in poor journals or rag journals. It was published in journals which really, really, really bear weight in the community and make us think. So what's our summary? Well, MGD impacts all aspects of eye care, vision fatigue, comfort, ocular service health, cataract surgery, premium eye oils, contact lenses, and even pain. The majority of all patients with dry eye have functional and structural MGD an uh, anomalies. MGD is prevalent, it's progressive, and it's chronic. It's the leading cause of dry eye throughout the world, at one stage at least. And function and structure make it simple. So we want to make it simple, just think in terms of function and structure. But because it's so prevalent, because it's so prevalent, it should be considered as the root cause of the majority of all dry eye. And we can make it fairly straightforward. What's the future? The future is to understand desecrating stress, to understand blinking, to understand the dental model, to understand how to use medications. And medications are certainly used to calm down the eye and to try to get control of a situation which is out of control 
because of desiccating stress on all of the sequelae. Unfortunately, there is no medication that helps with the neurosensory. There's no real medication which, uh, which allows treatment. Um, and the environment. And the future is indeed very, 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 uh, very limited. This happens to be a young lady who I have been married to for some length of time. And she was a very attractive young lady. And I sort of met her at a faculty meeting. And that's one of the great things that I can say about academia. It gave me my wife. And, and she has just been such a supporter. The early papers all have her name on it. She worked so hard with me. And then we had children. And with more children and more obligations. And then she became a politician, which we need. We need politicians, but we need good politicians. And she was a good politician, and she became the first female president of the American Academy of Optometry and many other accolades that, that she's earned. And I just have to tell you, Joan, thank you very much for all you've done for me. No one else in the world would have ever done it. And then, and then what I have to tell you is that that I have actually worked with over 400 scientists, uh, physicians, optometrists, ophthalmologists, residents, and fellows. And in Boston, Boston is the intellectual center of the world. We just have so many bright people. And I've had the chance to work with three chemists intimately who are among the top 100 in the world. And I've actually had a chance to work with the number one chemist in the world who was at Harvard, who's a personal friend, who's provided me with a great deal of counsel and understanding. And I can call him any time to ask him the questions that I ask you, amigo, and he provides me with an answer. And he is so good that there's a rating for chemists, and it's called the Hirsch rating, H-E-I-S-H. And if you Google the Hirsch rating today to find out who's the best chemist in the world, they'll tell you it's discontinued. And the reason is because George Whitesides won the, the, the award for being the number one chemist in the world. We should delete this from the tapes. Uh, he, he, he won the award for being the number one chemist in the world five times in a row. And people thought he shouldn't get the sixth. So, so we have these people in Boston. And without them, I'm just parroting back what I've learned from everybody. I don't know pathology. Tony Enrique taught it to me. I don't know a lot of what I've said. I didn't know it. But I've been, I've, I know enough. I've been taught enough by, by this wonderful group of, of, of people in Boston to which I'm, um, 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 I'm really forever grateful. And I say that very, very sincerely. And people say, well, why are you sometimes project yourself as being humble? Because every day I walk in the office, I meet five people who make me feel like I'm in the first grade. There's just that much difference in their brain power and the way they express themselves and the way they think. So it's always a great pleasure to come and talk to, to people, uh, particularly in Barcelona, where a lot of this started uh, with, with, with Tony Henriquez. And I really thank you for your attention at this late hour. And I would comment, I don't know whether, if anyone wants to see that, I'll let them make private arrangements to, to maybe set up a table and show them how it works uh, on, um, on, on people so you can get your glimpse image. Again, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Hello. If there are any questions for Dr. Corp, I, I will get you a microphone so that you can ask your question. Um, good evening, Dr. Corps. Thank you for your presentation. And um, I have a question for you for... Um, for uh, things that it's not so clear for me. Um, you are talking about uh, meibomial gland dysfunction, um, but always, like, uh, always only with uh, um, the proportion, like, um, the meibomial gland dysfunction, it's uh, uh, caused by the obstruction of the glands. But um, I remember, and maybe it's not like this, but I remember that I, I read like a lot of uh, your articles in the past years where um, you said that the Benbowman gland dysfunction, it's 
uh, a part of the cause is caused by the ob uh, obstructions of the glands, and a part of it's for the um, hyperproduction of the glands. So it was like it's caused by uh, it caused by the um, the hyperproduction of the glands that caused like a dryness or a burn or like the sensation of the burn and something like this. It's it's true that things or it's only the the obstructions, the MGD. Um, that's a good question. Uh, one of the answers is there can be many, many causes of my bone glands closing down. For instance, the drug Accutane will shut them right down. So there are drugs which will shut the innervation to the meibomian glands down. And the acne drug mm -hmm. that the dermatologists prescribe shuts down the meibomian glands virtually totally. They, they may maybe have 20% function. So there are other areas that can cause dysfunction of the meibomian glands, yes. But the usual cause is obstruction. Okay. Okay. The usual cause, 90% of it is caused originally by obstruction. Remember that there is no hyperproduction of my bombing glands. <laughs> Does it exist? No. You could see hyperproduction of of uh, fat in the in the sebaceous glands around the 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 uh, hairs of the skin, but my bombing glands are confined inside the rigid structure that is the tarsus. Uh, it doesn't exist, hyperplasia of my bombing glands, doesn't exist. So, uh, uh, gras, um, gr lagrimas grasas, it uh, doesn't exist. Maybe it's an alteration of the equilibrium of the contents of the tears. But hyperproduction of my bombing glands does not exist. Atrophy, yes, unfortunately. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the word hyper. That was the word that I missed when I, when I attempted to answer you. Um, there is one condition that, that, that is obvious that does happen which would lead you to believe that you have hypersecretion. And that is when you express them very, very, very frequently, if there's infection within the glands, you'll get copious amounts of material coming out. So we think that that is hyperproduction, but it's not hyperproduction. It's a reaction to all of that infective process and all of the materials which have been sent in to fight that. A lot of inflammatory material, is uh, infiltrative material, is just being excreted with the expression. So you'd think it would be hypersecretion, but it's not. Bueno, veo que no hay más preguntas. Good. There are no further questions. However, I do have one for you. What about saponification? He's asking about saponification. What about saponification? So kind of soap being formed. The tears are impaired, right? And they are... Uh, produced is this produced because of a problem inside the meibomian glands or not? Um, that's an excellent question. The question was saponification. Um, can that be produced by the meibomian glands? Well, one of the diagnostic signs that's both good and bad when you look at an eye is you look at the external canthus, and if at the external canthi you see bubbles, foam, as originally described by, uh, uh, by, um, uh, by Mogens Norn in Norway, uh, in, Den in Copenhagen. And he described 50 years ago that if you see foam, it's highly correlated with meibomian gland difficulties. So what happens is that you, the meibomian glands apparently do not have the correct mixture of the materials in them to prevent saponification. 
And when you blink hard with these individuals, if they blink hard, if you instruct them to blink hard, you'll find that 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 bubbles form and they go down the menisci and they go out and they sit on the skin and they frequently call what's called angular blepharitis, which is a a inflammation of the materials of, of the skin at the at the angle of both eyes at the external canthus, but on the externally on the skin. And for a long period of time that was treated with, with Kenalog was the was was the treatment of choice, a, a drug, and we now know that that's best treated uh, by just applying a clean lubricant such as Vaseline or an ointment, a bland ointment to that area. It works much better, but it's caused by the meibomian glands not secreting ideal uh, sebum, uh, so that's what causes. So the good news about that is that the meibomian glands are working. The bad news about it is they're not working perfectly. But the good news about it is most of those people with treatment, you can just bring them back like that. So I think it's a good sign. I think it's a great diagnostic sign. And if I had time, I would have listed that with a lot of other areas. But that's an excellent question. No voy a hacer una pregunta. Lo que quisiera es dar un testimonio. Actually, not a question, not a question, just a remark. Some of you haven't met me. However, I finished my studies, seventh, uh, seventh promotion in the optics school in Madrid, in the Valdez Institute, and that was back in 1965 when I finished. Now, 1974, I met Dr. Henriquez on the occasion of the first international conference on contact lenses. He had just got back from the States, Dr. Henriquez. 77, was that? Maybe. Okay, whatever they say. More or less. The thing is, I remember that Dr. Henriquez gave a presentation at the time, and as an ophthalmologist, myself, actually uh, all of us changed our, our view about the field. And uh, I think Dr. Corp was there, standing right next to him, or, or oh, well, not there, but uh, as, a, as a ubiquitous uh, figure, you were there, because the professional relation that you had could could be translated, it, it could be felt clearly, clearly, because of what uh, he was explaining to us, to optics and optometrists. Uh, it was like if you were there, Dr. Corb, and we now uh, are very happy and satisfied because we can enjoy this in our in our schools of optics and optometry. So I would just want to I just wanted to thank you both. Thank you both for your knowledge, for having this friendship, wonderful friendship that you have, and for what you've meant for the development and the progress in our profession. So give them a round, yes, a round of applause for them both because they really deserve it. Well, you know, if I, if I may just take the liberty of commenting, um, when you look at the relationship that I've had with Tony, it's, it's just unusual. Um, but it was the collaboration and the pursuit of a common goal to really make things better, which allowed us to, to move forward. And I remember many nights uh, when uh, we would go to work after we ate, and we would finish in Boston eating at 7 or 8 o'clock. And we worked till two o'clock in the morning, going over all these slides and coming up with it. And how Tony, after he finished his training, came back to Boston for maybe ten years for um, and spent two or three weeks with us, just continuing this and going over it. And when when he was talking and explaining all of what of, when he was commenting on his opinion, I was struck by the fact that in today's world, 
everything is so complex that you really have to collaborate. There's no other way. You have to get, you've always had to be taught by others who came before you. And the saying is, we stand on all their shoulders, and we certainly do. Uh, everything can't be an original research project. We have to have a base. And the higher the base, the more quickly we get to where we want to be. But, but collaboration uh, between people with good intentions just makes everything so much better, whether it's in science or whether it's in politics or whether it's in the world. And I just felt obliged to comment on that and how probably our institutions of higher learning, um, despite their Nobel Prize laureates in philosophy, don't really, don't really teach it in a manner that, that can be understood and can be utilized by, by those who now go out uh, to run the world that we live in. So that, that's just a comment, and I don't expect a response, but it's the way I think and it's the way Tony thinks, and I think that's the way most of the people with whom I've worked have thought. And those who don't think that way, you don't end up working with them very long. So I think it's just a good model to follow in all of our lives, including marriage. Thank you, Joan. <laughs> Good. I would like now to hand over to the representatives of the school here, because you're talking about training and education in optometry in Catalonia. So let me give me let, let me give the baton to the representatives of this school in English. Just one minute to explain that. Um, in the School of Optics and Optometry in Terrassa, we are now celebrating our 40th anniversary. It's 40 years of history now. And um, we thought, as an academic uh, institution, to celebrate this 40th anniversary. And uh, it came to us the idea of uh, giving an honorary um, degree to uh, Professor Corp. So on Wednesday at 11.30, uh, the university, Universitat Politécnica de Catalunya will, um, will give an honorary degree to Donald Corp, uh, honoris causa, doctor honoris causa for the UPC. Uh, as far as we know, this is uh, the first uh, degree that he's going to receive like that in a university uh, not in the States, but uh, in Europe. Uh, it's a great honor to us that you have accepted that, and you are all invited uh, to attend uh, this honorary degree on Wednesday at 11.30 at Ifici Vertex Campus Nord in the UPC. Thank you very much for having accepted that. It's a great honor to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. What else can I say? Here we see, uh, well, quite a lot of representatives of our profession. So what else can I say? I see familiar faces here. So it's uh, it's been a pleasure to have you all here tonight. Antonio, of course. And uh, nothing else from me. Thank you very much for joining us. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. And let's hope that we can have more, more multidisciplinary exchanges in the future. Thank you.